Well, I recognized most of the faces in the classroom. For those of you that have not been in, in a class with me, I'm Randy Geiger, and I'll be the um, instructor for this course. Um, as I mentioned, I have a lecture in Carver that gets out at, um, at 9.50. Um, I will try to um, be over here um, as quick as possible. Some days it might be uh, three or four minutes late, but I'll try to stay on time as much as I can. Um, I'd like to have a little bit of fun today, so I'll try to go through a few details about the course, and then and then hopefully we'll talk about things that are relevant to um, um, analog integrated circuit design. Um, so. Um, Here's my contact information. These lectures will be posted on the class website. Um, hopefully the streams will be posted as well. Um, there's been some change in staffing. Um, apparently some changes in server access for video streams. Um, I'm still working out the details on that. Um, the three labs are um, uh, gonna be in 2046 Coover, the same place we had the 330 um, labs. Course description. Um, basic analog integrated circuit and system design, including design space exploration, performance enhancement strategies, operational amplifiers we'll spend quite a bit of time with, um, reference circuits, um, a little bit of time on data converters and integrated filters. Um, I have an open door policy. I'll have office hours from 11 to 12, um, so I'll try to be there all the time then. Um, anytime in my office, you're welcome to stop by that outside of those hours. If you can't find me um, with an open door or in a normal office hours, send me an email or let me know and I'll be glad to set up an appointment. If you do use email, please include WE435 um, in the subject section. I try to respond to those um, as quickly as I can. Required textbook for the course um, is Analog Integrated Circuit Design, second edition. Um, I refer to as the Martin and John's book. They were the ones that did the first edition. Um, they added um, Carasone um, as an author on the second edition. There are several reference textbooks that are quite good. Um, I won't go through the details on these. They're posted on the website. There's also some other reference material I think is, is useful. We will use it a little bit in this course. Um, the Journal of Solid State Circuits, the Transactional Circuit and Systems, um, Proceedings of ISCUS, Proceedings of ISSCC, and on occasion, um, the um, information that's in the U.S. Patent and the Trademark Office. <clears throat> as far as the grading is concerned, there will be two or three exams. They'll all be weighted equally. One of those exams, there will be a final, so there may be one exam and a final, or there may be two exams and a final um, for 300 points uh, total. So if there's two exams, they're worth 150 points apiece. If there's three exams, they're worth 100 points apiece. Um, homework, 100 points total. Lab and lab reports, 100 points total. Design projects, 100 points total. Notice that in contrast for 330, which uh, most of you were in in the past, um, I have no attendance requirements um, as far as grading is concerned. Um, the reason I don't have attendance there um, is my experience has been we usually get near perfect attendance in 435. Um, so um, we will not uh, take attendance formally. Um, the final design project will be the design of an ADC or a DAC. Um, if you have a preference, you can pick that at this point in time or sometime before it's officially assigned. Um, it'll be an 8-bit or 10-bit uh, converter. Um, we'll set the specifications of the ADC on uh, an individual interest basis. Um, option will exist to have this uh, project fabricated through MOSES. Um, the design should be complete through post layout um, simulation. Um, we will also have an operational amplifier design part of, the, of this course. It'll be part of the laboratory experiment. It will not be considered um, as the design project even though we might spend three weeks or more on the design of an operational amplifier. Um, there's also a wiki that contains information um, related to using the tools in the laboratory. I encourage you to consider that as well. Topical coverage, um, we'll spend about a third of the course, maybe a little bit more on op-amp um, design, a little bit on comparator design, 
We'll talk about design strategies. We'll talk about design space exploration. Um, we'll talk about performance requirements. And we'll go into some of the basic building blocks that we use um, to build um, analog circuits and operational amplifiers. Talk about simulation strategies, talk about compensation, and spend quite a bit of time talking about architectures. Quite a few different topics here. We'll also talk about A to D's and, and DACs. Um, Nyquist rate primarily, a little bit on oversample data converters. We'll talk a little bit about voltage references, um, band gap references, and um, um, VT references. We'll talk a little bit about integrated filter design. If time permits, I'll make a few comments about phase lock loops. I have a challenge. There are two conferences um, that are reasonably accessible at this point in time. Um, one is the Midwest Symposium. It will meet in August in Windsor, Canada. Um, and topics um, include um, a lot of areas related to analog circuit design. Um, and should you choose to um, work on a, um, a paper that gets accepted at the conference, um, I will bump your letter grade um, one level. So if you have a B going and you get a paper accepted here and present it, you'll, you'll get an A. Um, if you have an A going, I can't bump it past an A. <laughs> Deadline for submission is March 18th. Um, notice acceptance should be April 29th. We should have acceptance information by the end of the semester. Um, there's also another conference that will take place this summer about two weeks earlier. It's NACON. These are actually two of the oldest conferences in the circuits area. Um, this focuses more on aerospace applications. It will meet in Dayton, Ohio, um, July 23rd through 26th. Um, abstracts are, are all that's required here. Um, they're typically a one-page abstract. Um, they're due on April 30th. Um, papers are due at the conference um, itself. Um, and here are the uh, areas of interest through NACON. Um, again, there's an analog device in the processing area, which I think that material related to this course would fit into quite nicely. Um, if you do an ACON paper, I will also boost your, your letter grade one level. If you do both, I'll only boost it once. Um, oh, the cost of attending the conferences will be the responsibility of the student. But oftentimes, uh, if students get papers accepted at a major conference, oftentimes the department will, will contribute to attending that conference. But I can't guarantee it. Here are some topics that could be um, of interest at the, either of these conferences. Dynamic comparators, integrated temperature sensors, MOS voltage references, temperature to digital converter, statistical matching characters, transistor current source, and we got to identify some other topics as well that might relate to, to interest that you have. I'd like to talk a little bit about how I'm going to approach this course relative to what I see done most of the time. Um, so we have kind of this infinite amount of uh, information available, and the way it's usually approached, the way your author approaches it, um, is we have these circuits appear. Um, I happen to have drawn several different operational amplifier circuits. They will all, all be familiar to, familiar to you shortly. And then we typically analyze those circuits and then hopefully understand how they operate. And then we modify or, or create or, or, or extend these circuits to meet a given set of applications. That's typically how things are done. And then we simulate and verify after we have an architecture and a, and a kind of a design, we, we tie, tend to simulate and verify. I'm not too crazy about this approach because the appear part, um, how, do we, how do we make them appear? And I'm not too crazy about the analysis approach because the analysis of some of these circuits can be really tedious. So here's the approach that I'd like to try to follow. I'd like to, first of all, develop an understanding of how a circuit should operate. And then I would like to synthesize a circuit that meets the requirements that we're after. 
So it's not a situation where something appears, we're gonna actually start from basic principles and make the circuit. <coughs> and then we'll analyze. It may be the case that if we have enough understanding, the analysis takes almost no time. We may embed the analysis in the understanding. And at that time, we, we may modify or extend the circuit to meet some specific, specific applications and then simulate and verify the performance. Significant difference in what I'd like to do. This is the approach that I see a lot of people wanting to follow. Um, they like to follow the appear approach. Here's a circuit. And then they like to go to the computer and start tweaking around values to see if they can make the circuit do what they want it to do. And, and, and I, I discourage this approach. I discourage this approach because you're going to find the number of handles or the hooks you have into a circuit is big. You might have 10 or 20 or 30 devices in your circuit <coughs> and you've got to pick dimensions of 10 or 20 or 30 devices. There's a lot of combinations if you have 10 or 20 or 30 degrees of freedom in your design. So I think when people take this approach, oftentimes they end up with non-optimal solutions if they obtain a solution at all. I think it's really important on any concept that's not well understood or on anything that we introduce to always ask the question, why are we doing it this way? And I don't mind getting stumped. So if you have a question as to why something is done, ask me. If I know the answer, I'll tell you. If I don't know the answer, I'll tell you. I don't know as well, but I'll probably try to look to see if I can find a solution. Okay. I always like to ask the question, what's a dumb question? Because nobody wants to ask a dumb question. My definition of a dumb question is the question you should have asked and didn't. Almost always, if you have a question, there are probably a bunch of other classmates sitting in the same room that have the same question. Okay. So we're gonna to start today talking about op-amp um, and comparator design. And I'll try to have a little bit of fun about this, but it's also related to the question of why. Why are we doing things a certain way? So, the question is, what's an op-amp? We're going to design op-amps. have to ask the question, what is an op-amp? What's an op-amp? Differential, Differential amplifier. What kind of amplifier? Who said that? Differential voltage amplifier. What, what's the input? What's the input impedance? High, high input impedance. What's the output impedance? Low. Low output impedance. And how about the voltage gain? High, high. high open loop voltage gain. Wow. Very good. Y you impress me. You've learned very well from 2.30. So I think it's really important that a designer must be aware of what an amplifier really is. You have to be aware of what the real customer needs are. You certainly need to, um, to understand the requirements um, because what you're going to find that if you're designing things like operational amplifiers or amplifiers, the application specific requirements are oftentimes dramatically different than the requirements for catalog parts. Many amplifiers are over-designed because the real needs of the customer are not conveyed. It's real easy for a system designer to say, oh, I need an op-amp that has these characteristics. If those specifications are very tight, 
it may put a big burden on the uh, circuit designer to design that op amp. So it's important that you really work with the customer and find out what they really need if they want to get a good solution to their problem. Conventional wisdom, which is just what I got a bit ago about an operational amplifier, conventional wisdom will not necessarily provide the best or even good or even an, a viable solution. So when I asked what an operational amplifier was, you guys did an excellent job of describing an operational amplifier as I've seen it discussed um, in 230. And that reflects what I think of as conventional wisdom. Okay. Well, conventional wisdom is important because we need to consolidate lots of detailed information to kind of get a general picture for how things go together. So conventional wisdom is important, but it's important that conventional wisdom be derived in the right way. Might ask the question, how does an uh, amplifier differ from an operational amplifier? When operated linearly, an operational amplifier is a high gain amplifier that is intended to be used in a feedback application. <coughs> feedback is needed to improve linearity and gain accuracy. Operational amplifiers don't have much linearity usually and don't have much gain accuracy. The more general amplifier is generally used open loop. So if you talk about an amplifier, we don't typically provide feedback around the amplifier. We use that open loop. Now that amplifier may have embedded in it an operational amplifier. So conventional wisdom is an open loop amplifier. And you looked at open loop amplifiers um, in 330, the common source, the common drain, and so forth. Conventional wisdom is that an open loop amplifier is much simpler to design and use than an op amp. We'll have better high frequency performance. We'll be less linear than a feedback circuit to use an op amp. And we'll be less accurate than feedback circuits with an op amp. That's pretty much conventional wisdom. We went to op amps to circumvent some of these problems that the simpler amplifiers have. So let's go back and see what the experts say beyond the experts in the classroom about what an operational amplifier is. So I'm going to consider one of the most popular textbooks on the subject that's used around the world today. It's incredible what impact Senator and Smith have had on electronics instruction around the world. Um, I haven't done a recent survey, but we did a survey a number of years ago and like 80% of the schools that we surveyed were using the Severn Smith book for their electronics course. Most of the remaining 20% were using books that were written by authors internal to the university. The first edition came out in 1982. The seventh edition came out in 2014. I was visiting with the Del Cedra Oh, probably around 85. I, I know him reasonably well. And he made the statement at that time that he was making more money from his textbook than he was for his job as a university professor. He went on to become the provost of the University of Toronto and, and so forth. Um, and that was in the early stages of the textbook. Um, so here's what Cedra has said since day one. <clears throat> the op-amp is designed to sense the difference between two voltage signals applied at its two inputs, i.e. the quantity V2 minus V1, multiply this by number A, and cause the resulting voltage A times V2 minus V1 to appear at the output terminal. The input impedance of the op-amp is supposed to be infinite, and the output impedance of the op-amp is supposed to be zero exactly what you guys indicated an op amp is. And to be sure there's no confusion, um, here's a copy of a figure that's in the textbook. And we see the two inputs, V1 and V2, one output, um, zero output impedance, infinite input impedance, and he lists the characteristics. Infinite input impedance, zero output impedance, zero combo gain, 
infinite overload gain and infinite bandwidth that he would also like. So, textbook definition. Voltage amplifier with a very large gain. Right? Differential input and single input output. Very high input impedance. Very low output impedance if it's not ideal. This is the conventional wisdom. Does this correctly reflect what an operational amplifier is? Let's look at the op amp from a, from a time perspective. What I've just described <coughs> is a Severn Smith view of the op amp from 1982 to the present. Actually, we're talking about op amps primarily because of the work of Black. Um, Black sketched on the on a New York Times uh, newspaper um, in August of 1927, um, a circuit that had a high gain amplifier in it. And if you analyze the circuit, this is basically the two resistor feedback circuit that you probably looked at as your first op amp application in 230. He did not use the term op amp. We're rather focused on the basic concept of feedback involving the use of high gain amplifiers. And he wanted to address problems associated with, with, with linearity and accuracy in building open loop amplifiers. It's interesting that even though Black came up with this idea in 1927, it took seven years until he got the work published. Um, this is a Wikipedia article, I believe. It says, to some, his invention is considered the most important breakthrough in the 20th century in the field of electronics. And that may well be a reasonable statement. This sketch that he had on the New York Times that took seven years to get published has really had a big impact on the electronics field. He observed that it has been found possible to extract extraordinary improvements in the constancy of amplification, that is gain accuracy, and freedom from nonlinearity using this feedback concept. When I study electronics, um, I used the book in the middle. And this was a book by Millman. Millman published an electronics book in 1958. And um, he had three editions of it. The third edition was in 1972, about eight years before, or 10 years before Cedra and Smith came along. It's interesting that Milman dominated the electronics market through the 60s um, and the 70s. So he had about a 25 year domination of the electronics market as well. So there's two authors primarily that dominated the market in the last 70 years or something, Milman and Cedric Smith. And here's what was in the book that I had. Um, we had something called a base amplifier and some feedback elements. And they modeled the base amplifier as a two input device with an input resistance R in and output impedance R out. Um, and they referred to the operational amplifier as the whole feedback circuit. Um, and the, the base amplifier is what we now refer to as an operational amplifier. Okay. So note the base amplifier is modeled as voltage amplifier with a single, oh, but it's got a single entity input, not a differential input, um, because one terminal is grounded here. So at that time, the operational amplifier was the whole feedback circuit, and the base amplifier was a single input, single output, 
high gain amplifier. In 1972, Milman changed his view, and he now defined this as an operational amplifier. He used the same terminology that Cedra um, is using now, but this came out about a decade before Cedra. So basically, Cedra adopted the second view of an operational amplifier that Milman had. Big change in concepts over the period of about two and a half decades by Milman on what an operational amplifier is. The seminal source for the term operational amplifier um, came by a guy by the name of Ragazzini um, in 1947 in the proceedings of the IRE, which is the predecessor to the proceedings of the IEEE now. IRE was the predecessor to IEEE. And he made the statement, he coined the term, the term operational amplifier is a generic term applied to amplifiers whose gain functions are such to enable them to perform certain useful operations such as summation, integration, differentiation, and or combination of such operations. And that's basically what Millman uh, viewed as the operational amplifier. Here's a picture of a circuit, figure one, in Black's paper, the one that was published finally in 1934. Um, and we see the two inputs with a particular type of feedback, it's called voltage series feedback um, in, in this. And he showed that if the gain of the amplifier mu is high, then the gain of this feedback amplifier is approximately equal to over beta, which is, which is the standard uh, feedback equation. So here's kind of a summary of what happened. Um, 1927, Black introduced the concept. Seven years later, he published it. Um, then in 1947, um, the concept of the operational amplifier was formalized. That took a long time from the time that Black, almost a generation from the time Black came up with the idea until the concept was formalized. Wow, something so important takes a long time to evolve, doesn't it, to get traction. And then we went through Millman's view of what an op amp was, and then he changed and, um, and um, this arrow should have been back here. Um, in 1972, um, the um, change took place in Milton, but they've been, they've been the same view um, since 1972. So do we have it right now? I've kind of traced the history around. It's not just in Iowa State, it's not just in the United States, this is pretty much the view around the world as to what a, an operational amplifier is. So let me go back to a diagram very similar to Black's. This is certainly the concept that Black proposed. And I, I'm not labeling these variables as, as voltages now. I'm just referring to them as signals, an input signal and an output signal. <clears throat> I have what we call a sampling circuit here. Uh, <coughs> the signal at the output gets multiplied by, by beta. So we have beta x out of pairing here. That's subtracted from x in, and that's passed through the A amplifier. So you can show that um, x out over x in for this circuit, which is a gain in feedback as we call it, is A over 1 plus A beta standard feedback equation. And if A is large, it's 1 over beta. This is Black's idea. The op-amp is an enabling element then that's used to build feedback networks. Let's analyze this circuit here. Oh, that's a, that's a 230 problem. The first op-amp circuit you looked at in 230. I can sum currents of this node here. And I'll get this equation. And I know that if the amplifier has an output that's equal to the voltage gain AB times V1, I get this equation. I've got one extra unknown in those two equations. That's V1. I can eliminate V1, and I get the V out over Vn is minus R2 over R1 divided by 1 plus 1 plus R2 over R1 times 1 over AB. As AB goes to infinity, this disappears. Um, 
this disappears, excuse me, and I'm just left with R2 over R1. Now I've assumed in this analysis that the input impedance is zero, because there's no current that flows into that minus terminal. I assume the output impedance is zero, and when I let the gain get large, I basically assume the gain goes to infinity. Does this imply that the operational amplifier needs to be a good voltage amplifier? Certainly if it's a good voltage amplifier, I get V out over Vn is equal to one over beta. But does that imply that the operational amplifier needs to be a good voltage amplifier? So now let me put in the model of um, the amplifier that includes the input impedance and the output impedance. A little bit more work now. I can again apply Kirchhoff's current law to this node and this node. And if I apply Kirchhoff's current law to those two nodes, I get these two equations. Um, I hope that nobody in, in this class is confused with my notation. Um, I use a G to refer to a reciprocal of a, of a resistance. So G1 is a reciprocal of, of R1. G2 is a reciprocal of R2. Gn is a reciprocal of Rn, and so forth. I do that. We, we really had a choice back in the 20s about whether we wanted to refer to these elements that we use a squiggly symbol for as resistors or conductors. And we typically refer to them as resistors. However, you're going to find that most electronic circuits have a relatively small number of nodes, so Kirchhoff's, so nodal analysis is usually what we use to analyze those circuits. If I want to apply Kirchhoff's current law here, I get some currents here, and this, this voltage here, V1, um, um, minus Vn divided by R1, that's this current here, plus V1 minus V out over R2, that's this current here, um, plus V1 over R, and that's current here, those have to sum to zero. So if I use Kirchhoff's current law and use resistors, I got this one over appearing all the time. So it's easier to say if you use the terms of conductances. So I can say V1 times the sum of the conductance adjacent to the node, G1 plus G2 plus Gn. Now I see where they came from. It's equal to G1 Vn plus G2 V out plus Gn V1. And that's the first equation. So you'll save yourself a lot of time usually if you work with conductances rather than work with resistances. You can almost write down Kirchhoff's current laws by inspection that way. Make sense? The same thing applies to the output node. Oh, if you solve those two equations, it's a little bit tedious. And we get this really nasty expression. Okay. But if AV is large, then this term dominates this, and this term dominates this, so I can neglect this, and I can neglect this, so for AV large, <clears throat> I get the V out of Vn is equal to minus R2 over R1. Notice that this solution is not dependent upon R in, or R out, or R L. So we assumed R in was infinite, we assumed R out was equal to zero, and we neglected R L in our previous discussion of op amps. Now we include them, and we analyze it, and we see the analysis didn't depend upon R in or R out, or R L. So if it didn't depend upon those parameters, why was it important that the input impedance was infinite and the output impedance is zero, and why was it important that we can neglect R L? Well, there's four basic types of amplifiers. A voltage amplifier, a current amplifier, a transconductance amplifier, and a transresistance amplifier. These are the symbols that are pretty standard for, for the four types. So this has an output voltage that's equal to the gain times the difference of these two voltages. Um, this one has an output current that's equal to a transconductance gain times the difference of the two voltages and so forth. So I could take this op amp circuit here and, and just pull out the voltage control voltage source op amp and put in a 
a transconductance amplifier or a current amplifier in the circuit and ask the question, how would these circuits perform if the transconductance gain is large or the current gain is large? Of course, the input impedance here is ideally zero. And the output impedance is ideally infinite. It's about as far away from what you can get from the, from the input and output characteristic of voltage amplifier. So let me consider the one with the, with the OTA. Again, if I sum currents at, at, at the two nodes, <coughs> I get these three equations. And I get this for the voltage gain. And if I let GM go to infinity, um, the, did I do something wrong? This disappears. GM goes to infinity, so this term disappears, and I'm left with minus R2 over R1. So I get the same gain if I use a transconductance amplifier as if I use a voltage amplifier. A transconductance amplifier with an infinite input impedance and an infinite output impedance. If I put a current amplifier in, I find I get the same gain. In fact, all four amplifiers will give the same closed loop gain, provided the open loop gain is large. <coughs> so we need a large gain, but we don't need any input impedance characteristics or any output impedance characteristics that we've had before. Hmm. So I wonder, I wonder why we have our definition of an op amp that has a, has to be a voltage amplifier with a with a infinite input impedance and zero output impedance. We see a dramatic difference in the port impedances of those four types of amplifiers. So, textbook definition: voltage amplifier with a large Voltage gain, very high input impedance, and a very low output impedance. Was that necessary? Not at all. How about the other part? Differential input, single and output. I mean, these guys have missed it for four decades in regard to the characteristics of the amplifier. How about the rest of it? Differential input and single and output. Um, if I look at this application, which is much more common than this one, I have two inputs, but I ground one. If I ground an input, does it do me any good? No, I'm not using it. So in fact, in this application, this is really just needs a single unit input and a single unit output. Many applications, most applications, just need a single unit input and a single unit output. And notice the gain with feedback is not necessarily equal to 1 over beta. So here's a situation where we put in a single unit amplifier with a gain AB and very amplifier, and we get the same minus R2 over R1 um, gain with that circuit. In fact, if you go back to um, 1973, um, we saw that um, National Semiconductor was taking their digital inverter, the d inverter we looked at in 330, and they were proposing using it as an operational amplifier. Single unit input, single unit output. At the time, op amps may have cost 30 bucks. Um, you could buy a, a, a HEX 7404 for, for maybe 50 cents. So they said, hey, you've got four op amps here in this package for for a few cents. But in integrated applications, we almost never work with single unit outputs. We almost always have differential outputs. We have differential inputs and differential outputs. <clears throat> <coughs> Did 
differential outputs are seldom available in catalog parts, but used almost exclusively in integrated applications. Hmm, I wonder why. So do we have it right now? Voltage amplifier? Nope. High input impedance? Nope. Low output impedance? Nope. Differential input? Nope. Single and output? Nope. Large gain? Yeah. So what's an operational amplifier? What uh, operational amplifier is a large gain amp? That's the right answer. And and why we've gotten bogged down with these characteristics that have been pushed around at us for for 50 years, um, I don't know. Because we don't use them. Go back and look in your 230 text and see if you ever used the fact the input impedance was infinite. Or ever used the fact the output impedance was zero. Or address the issue of why RL was not considered. Um, <clears throat> if you look at the structure, you'll find that the uh, Gain with feedback um, is a function of two betas, um, one beta that appears in the denominator and one beta that appears in the, in the numerator. We'll go into more detail on that um, a, a little bit later. So op amp is the enabling element needed to build feedback amplifiers. The port configurations, whether single ended input or differential input, and single ended output or differential output, um, it depends upon the applications that you're looking at. But in almost all integrated applications, it's going to be differential input, differential output. Now, oh, we're out of time. So we, we've concluded that an operational amplifier is a circuit that has a very high gain. But there's some other things we'd oftentimes like to have. We'd like to have, well, sometimes we like low output impedance, sometimes at high. Sometimes we like high input impedance, sometimes low. Often we want a large output swing, but not always. Sometimes we want a large input range, but not always. Sometimes we want a good high frequency response, but not always. You get too much frequency response, you get too much noise a lot of times. Um, a lot of times you like to fat settle fast, not always. Um, if it's feedback, we generally require adequate phase margin. We'll talk about that later. Good common mode rejection ratio is important. Good power supply rejection ratio, low power dissipation, reasonable linearity, and so forth. So there's a lot of other things we'd like to have in these things we call operational amplifiers besides the large gain. So let me close this with the question, do we have it right now? You be the judge. That's all for the debate, thanks. Is there a lab this week? Yeah, there will be a lab this week. Is there a homework through Friday? It's been posted. <laughs> But it's not due Friday. Oh, it's not? It's due Wednesday of next week.